This is tape three with Rabbi Abba Braunspiegel, and it's November 26, 1998. Yeah. I do, at one point, we found out that we are being, uh, the rumor was that the Russians are coming. I knew it from my mother. And I knew the Eden began being happy that uh, the Russians are coming. See, many of the Eden knew more, than I didn't know, but they had ways, I don't know how they knew what's going, a little bit what's, what's going on. They must have had it in red, I don't know what. Anyway, uh, at one point we were, my brother, my two brothers were taken out of the camp, the whole transport of Eden was shipped away. This was in January. In the middle of it was very cold. Was there snow? Yeah, there was snow, I don't know that day, but anyway, there, yeah, there was snow, yes. And anyway, they were taken away on one day. A day or two later, I and my mother and my father were also taken. There was a train station there, or whatever, I don't know what it was. It was a chilik maybe of one or two days. And what I, first I'll tell you what I, what I remember myself. We did not know what happened to the first transport, where my brothers went. Uh, uh, we, s they brought us to a place, I think it was the train station, and we already heard bombing. We already heard shootings, we did, we, and it was, the Eden already knew that the Russians are closing in. And the Germans were basically trying to take as many Eden out, but they needed us for work. They, the, the, in, in, in Chastokov, they used to make bullets for the German army. What did your parents do? My father worked uh, in, in, in one of those factories. There, there were factories there did your mother for the work? German military. Was your mother working at that time also? Yeah, also, yeah, I forgot what she did. I think my father worked with bullets, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I forgot exactly what my mother did. She told me, I forgot. Uh, it was all basically for the German military. Uh, the clothing for them, uh, this, uh, other things, uh, and, and, and for the war machine. Uh, now, we, they, we were seated on top of barrels of oil or benzene and we and the Germans were all around us with weapons. They were had their weapons aimed at us. Now we don't know what happened. We heard a lot of bombings, and all of a sudden, out of the we didn't know what happened. We didn't see any Germans. And after a while, we some Yid got up and said, "Yidn is an Afrai, the Deutschen sind ein So now, so what happened was that the Russians. When they, when they came, the, the Germans already knew that the Russians are coming. They tried, they didn't tell us, obviously, but so, so what happened was this. They, they surrounded us as long as they could, but then they themselves ran away. They escaped. They went wherever they went, and they left us. All they had to do was turn around, give one shot, because the whole thing was full of oil and benzene. It would have, it would have been gone up in flames. There would have been an explosion, and we would have been killed. For some reason, nothing happened. They, they just ran away, and we were left to ourselves. And then the Russians came. Right afterwards, the Russians came, and the Russians were very good to us, especially to the children. They gave us chocolates, candies, cookies, but I don't know, with all kinds of food. And also, they began, Eden began uh, quickly seeing who was left, who was not. I uh, and my parents were together. My two brothers, this we found out afterwards, were taken to Buchenwald. That is Yisroel and, uh, and the Oslo. They were taken to Buchenwald. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you, they, I know they, what they told me about Buchenwald. And eventually they were taken to the Reisenstadt. And that's where they were, and, and Buchenwald was a terrible, was the worst, and then chance to help. There was an extermination camp, and, uh, and many Eden died. And what's the chilek? They were, the, the, the point is, I was saved by one day. If they had taken me at the first transport, they just, they didn't have it. The Germans did everything quickly when they, uh, when they, when they realized the Russians are coming. So uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, so they just didn't have enough space for us. But by luck, uh, there was a Nesman that uh, we were on the second transport, and that they didn't make it, so we remained in Chastokov. 
Now, I'll tell you right away what happened. I, right after the, Ger the Russians came in, we moved into town. We didn't, we didn't stay in the camp. So I do not know how my parents found it. Uh, my parents, I, and the former camp commandant, this Mr. Uh, Vanguard from Dumblin, was with us, and a few more Eden were with us. We found an empty house. We just moved in. And to our luck, in the basement of that house, we found sacks of flour. That house, it was obvious, was being used by the Germans. And they had stacked up a lot of flour. So all I remember is for the next, I don't know how long, we stayed in Chenstorov after the Bafrayung, we ate matzis. Our main food was matzis, because we had flour, right? There was, it was a regular, there was water. There, the oil either was it was snow. It was the, the I remember being uh, on a on a schlitten. Uh, that's uh, on a sled. A, on, 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 on a sled. Yeah, on a sled. We used to go by. Uh, I, that I remember distinctly, especially in Chenstokov. And we lived in that house for quite a while. I do remember that one night, a bunch of heathen came in the middle of the night, and they took out this Mr. Vanguard, and they gave him a they gave him a, a beating. They, they, as I mentioned before, some Yidin did not like him. They claimed that some of their relatives were killed or punished because of him. The, I remember uh, it was he, his wife, and they had a young daughter. Mr. I'm a little bit older than I. I think her name was Ruti. And they, they really, or did they give him a beating? We could hear his cries. And uh, anyway, in the morning he was left to himself in blood and... Uh, uh, he, he, he survived, he went back to Germany, he lived in Vienna. Eventually, he came to Frankfurt am I. And just, just a second. <coughs> in in Chainstochov itself, what else do we remember about Chainstochov? Except the daily appeals and the hiding and the, the being hungry all the time. In Chainstochov, I felt hunger more than in Demblin. Uh, just a second. I was also cold, uh, especially at night, and uh, I was always, in, most of the time we, I was inside, I was not outside. Eventually, some, once in a while we used to go outside when we had permission to go from, our, from someone. Just a second. In Chainstochov itself, uh, no, I do not know of anyone making even an attempt to escape. I don't think there was, was possible there. In Demblin, it was only possible to escape because the conditions were much better, and we were not under the SS in the beginning. Only at the end were we under the SS. Did you ever return home? What? Did you ever return home? Yes, after the war. Oh, yes, I'll tell you what happened. After living in Chainstokov for a while, my parents decided they didn't know where to go. So we split up all the families that were in that house, and we decided to go back. Now, on the way back, the, the train was, we somehow, I don't know, my parents, I don't know how they get money. I, I don't know, they had some money because they had to buy tickets for the train. All, all I remember is my father went ahead. He went back to Demlin. And at one time, I and my mother went back to Demlin. The train was stopped in the middle and Poles came onto the train. They, I mean, now I know who they were. They were from the AK. It was a common experience, but the Aka, the Aka was, uh, they were terrible. They used to kill Yidin after the war. They used to stop a train in the middle, go car by car and shoot people on the spot. If they, if they recognized the Yid, they shot him on the spot. Now, they, I do remember them coming into our car. But for some reason, I don't know, uh, I think I looked pretty Jewish, even without a beard, but Somehow they left us. They didn't do anything to us. But I but we heard shots. They killed other Yidman on the train. Anyway, we made it back to Demblin. And I remember distinctly we when I when we came to Demblin, I and my mother, we had no food. So my mother went to Sh former Shrenum of ours. First of all, we found our house was vacant for some reason. Our own house. We my parents owned a house and a business in Demblin. It was vacant. And we were able to move in just like that, but we had no food. Was My it all familiar to you when you went back? What? Was it all familiar? Yeah, yeah. I recognized the house, yes. 
And uh, my father, in the meantime, had gone to Lublin because he had heard that in Lublin there's a whole the more Yidin, and so we didn't have any food. So my mother went to the immediate Shechinim to beg for food. And all I remember, I was there at the door. They opened up the door, they saw my mother, they knew her. They, some quickly shut the door, and some actually told us, you mean Hitler didn't kill you, didn't kill all of you, why did you come back, something like this. Not one of them wanted to give us anything. But what happened was, the Russians were good to us. The Russians gave us food. And to the, to the extent that the Russians knew that they are cars very bad, they are, the Russians told us, you tell us which poles are bad to you. And they took care of them. Took taking care meant uh, many times shooting them. Because the, the Poles didn't like the Russians, and the Russians did not like the Poles. There was a, some immediate hatred between them. And very often, the Russian army used to go into the woods to clean out the Akka. Now, I remember distinctly, after a while, my father came back from Lublin, and he came back already with money and provisions. He came back. My father was a very energetic person. So he came back, and it was, uh, I, all I remember is it was close to Pesach. I remember the first Seder, actually, I remember, was after the war, in, the, in our hometown, in Demblin. So Who came to that Seder? Well, first, I forgot all the people. I, my mother, my father, and we had, uh, uh, what was her name, a uh, uh, distant relative of ours, uh, Hodes. Her name was Hodes. She eventually lived in Australia. She married, she left children. She doesn't live anymore. She died in Australia. Uh, and uh, some other Eden, I don't remember. And also some soldiers we had it. Some Russian soldiers. As a matter of fact, they brought us provisions. They were eaten. They knew so they brought Do you them. know what they brought? I don't remember. What my father brought a lot. Matzas he brought from Lublin, and he gave it to other families who came back to them. Lean. And I remember distinctly the following uh, story. What my father, for some reason, began doing business right after. I don't know how he did it. And he, uh, he dealt in all kinds of things. He, first of all, my father, oh, yeah, oh I do know. My father had hidden money and diamonds, whatever, in the backyard. And I think he was able, he found, uh, if not all of it, most of it, and he was able to do business with this. And one day, a Russian soldier came to our house with a sack. It was loot. He had, it, was right after, it was right after the war. And he had heard that my father, he told my father he heard that he's a businessman. He wanted rubles for the sack of diamonds. Now my father had dollars, he didn't have rubles. And my father told me that that sack full of, of diamonds, if, the, if he was able to buy it, he would have been a millionaire for the rest of his life. But the stupid Russian soldier wanted rubles. So my father told him that he doesn't have rubles, he has dollars. So the Russian soldier, I, I was there when it happened. I didn't know the significance, but. The, the stupid Russian soldier said he does not know what dollars is no good. Rubles is good. And my father told me rubles at that time were worthless. Maybe if you had a sack full of rubles, it would be equal to one dollar. Anyway, my father wanted to give him ten thousand dollars. I forgot, I shouldn't say this. I, a lot of dollars that he had. And the stupid Russian soldier said, no, he wants rubles. And he, he didn't say that he, 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 he left. I, he was, many of the Russians, uh, it's amazing, many of the Russian soldiers were stupid. Like this one. Also, they were naive. But they had a hatred for the Germans and the, for the Poles. That they had, and they were very good to us. They were good for, to all the Eden. They gave us a lot of things, whatever, we, whatever they could. They, the Russians, by the way, are good-natured people. They, a Russian is able to, to share his, a piece of bread with you. They gave us whatever they had, they gave us. Especially to the children, they were extremely nice. They only wanted to know we should tell them which Polacks were bad to us. So they ever questioned what had happened during the war? They knew. They didn't question us because they knew. They knew. They didn't. It's not like, not like today that people deny it and you have to tell them about this. They, they went through it too in, in, a, different, in a different sense. And uh, How long did you stay back in the house? I don't remember how long. I, I don't remember. We had to, oh yes, what ha oh, another thing that happened in Demlin was right after the war. 
that I saw. It was after Pesach, and uh, one day I was looking out the window, and some there were other Eden who also came back, and the Polacks surrounded one or two Eden on the street, and then all oh, the next thing I saw was they shot them on the street. I saw this myself. Did you know those people? I I think so. I don't remember the name, but I did know them. Bishas Mansi, yes, I did know them, and. Uh, and apparently, my parents told me that this was a common experience. The Jews who, who made it through the war, they came back to their hometown simply because they had no other place to go. So they figured, let's go back to them. That was the only thing they knew. There was no one helping us, really, except the Eden themselves made some sort of... Like I mentioned, my father was involved in Hatzalah with the Eden in Lublin. And, uh, was he affiliated with the group in New York? What? Was he affiliated that, at uh, that time with anyone in New York? I, do not, no, I don't know. We had family in New York who eventually sent us uh, later on. I'll, t I'll come to that later on. They sent us affidavits to come to America. But uh, uh, men, the, the Polacks killed many Eden, f f not even because they did something. Just Thomas, they killed them on the street. Just like there was a Kelsa prog program. At that time it happened. Right in, in, I think it was in 45, I don't remember the exact year. I was at that time in Poland. We heard about it, about the Kelsa program. So there were little pogroms in every town. The Eden came back. Many Eden were killed how by long, the Polacks. Uh, how long did you stay there once you went there? So I don't remember how long I stayed in Demlin, but our next stop was, we, we, we realized we, oh, oh yes, we went to Lodge. Oh, I, we did not stay long. Oh yeah, now I remember. We went to Lodge, of course. In Lodz, I stayed outside, I don't know how long, Lodz already, Lodz is the second biggest town in Poland. And in Lodz, we, my, my parents opened up a kosher restaurant. And that's when I began going to Cheda. Uh, my first, in Lodz, there was one main, uh, there was a general uh, station, was, uh, yeah, what was it called? Just a second, I know. I just a second, why does that escape? Zachodnia Zexen Zachzik. That was the address. Zachodnia is a street, 66. There, the Eden right away had a cheder. They made a yeshiva. Did you go to yeshiva? Then? Well, I, no, I, I was too young. I had cheder. I started learning Aleph base right after the war. Where was your cheder? So, at, on that, in Lodge and the Zachodnia 66. It was, a, it was a known ad. You said that there was the, like a Jewish community was there. There was an, there was a, a uh, community kitchen, and Eden, there were some people learned there. It was like a big hoif, a yard and uh, with houses, which uh, the Eden took over. Who was your rabbi there? So wait, so I'll tell you, my rabbi was uh, an, an old Yid. He was over 70. He saved himself, he and the seven sons. All, he himself was a very strong man yet. They were all Gibayrim. They were hidden in a bunker in Poland. They never... And some, a Pole was good to them. He brought them food. And he took a nether that if he survives, he will uh, uh, teach Jewish children. And he was a very strict rabbi. He had, I don't know if you, you know what a kanchik is? A whip. In those days in the Chadarim, the rabbeim had a whip. It was, it was a special whip. A kanchik was a very thick. If you were hit with this, you'd really hurt. He had one of those, and he was very strict. But for some reason, we knew he loved every one of us. He was, he, he was strict and at the same time very loving. And we were all very loyal to him. And he taught us about, uh, about HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he taught us, he mainly instilled in us a munah. And uh, to be thankful to Hashem. And he taught us Aleph Beis. He went, I don't know exactly how far I went with him. Uh, I began, I learned how to daven a little bit there. And we lived, uh, my father became a, uh, we had a, a kosher restaurant, but really in, in, in reality, my father's real business was not a kosher restaurant. He had, uh, my father was, well, today it's called the black market. He became a money trader. He traded dollars for other currencies. Also, he dealt, they were called chazeremlech, gold coins. They, they even called it chazeremlech. It was a big business. And in, in, in Lodge, uh, my father dealt uh, in this. And the police, the Polish police used to raid our house very often. Except my father, a, a Yid, 
who went through the camps, he became a detective in the Polish, uh, in the Polish uh, police. And he used to come uh, eat by us. So he informed my father when, uh, when the police are going to raid the house. And the police came so often, they never found anything. Our, our restaurant in Lodz became a shame double. Uh, first of all, whoever came to Lodz came to our restaurant. And moreover, Russian generals came to our, they, they heard about that, we, that uh, we have very good food, which was true. And Who did the cooking there? My mother. My mother did the cook. My mother and also a, a, a very close friend of, from, who survived together with us, they together did the cooking. We had other help. Who was that, the friend? She lived, oh, she may still be alive. She, I have a picture of her and her son. Her son like, is a, lives in Paris now. She became a, she became a seamstress after the war. Uh, she lives in Paris. I know if she's still alive because she was the same age as my mother, and I doubt that she's alive. By now, she would have been in uh, close to a hundred. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, anyway, in Lodge we had this restaurant, but my 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 father became very rich in Lodge. And then we decided in Lodge. By the way, there was a Jewish community. There was already I knew about davening. We, my my father had his own minion in in our house. And P I and the Rabbanim used to come, and Rabbanim used to learn with me. A little. I picked up a lot of knowledge right after the war, and then eventually we decided to leave Poland because my father has told us there's no future. Oh yes, in the meantime, my father was looking for for my brothers. He wa he found out that they are they made it, and he was able to bring. I forgot exactly when I, when when the reunion took place, but they we we were reunited. My father saw to it that it cost him money, but he finally managed to get my brothers to come to us. Were you able to find any other surviving family? Yes, yes, we did find. We found a few, as a matter of fact. My first two, co I have two cousins who are still alive, first cousins. One lives in New York, his name is Cooperman. My mother's maiden name was Cooperman. My mother was uh, his aunt. Uh, and uh, and just a second, uh, and another one, his name is Ignaz Bubis. He is a very imp a famous person. He is the head of the Jewish community now in Germany. He lives in Frankfurt am Main. How we went he through the camps together with us. Was he related? Yeah, he's the first cousin of mine. My father was his uncle. What, what was the sibling? His, his, parents. My, uh, his mother and my brother and my father were brother and sister. His father was a Gerachoset. He was killed in the camps, the father. And uh, he, he's, he's, I mean, he lives in, uh, he's also, he's a very rich man too, Ignaz Bubis. He, he's written up very often in newspapers. What does his position entail? Do you know what, what uh, he's What he does? With? I know he, I, he does many good things. In, for the German community, for the J Jewish German community in Germany, yes, he does a lot. He helps people. He's also he is the liaison between the German government and the Jewish community of all Germany. He's also active in the Eretz He's very. He's a very. He's a particular politician too. But he's basically a businessman. He owns real estate. Uh, he owns a jewelry store. I know. He he's a very rich man. Baruch Hashem. Did you leave the area to, um, after living in Lodz, did you go on to any So other eventually areas? we decided, my father decided that, that there's no future in Poland for us, especially because of the children, and we are going to go to Germany. We really didn't know where to go, to Erzisrael, to America, but we, our next step, this is how it, we were told it was going to be, that was in, uh, was in Germany. We, anyway, in order to go to Germany, it wasn't easy, you had to smuggle. So we went to a town called Stratin. Or Stettin, I'm not sure which one. Stettin, Stettin, Stettin. It's on the border of Germany and Poland. We stayed there a very short time until my father was able to arrange with a smuggler. You had to pay them a lot of money, oh, a lot of money. My father had no problem paying the money. And they were smuggled us through 
to Berlin, to Germany. And once we came to Germany, I forgot how it went. We ended up in Berlin. And I lived in Berlin from 1946 or something. I'm not sure exactly, till 1951. Where did you stay there? So in Berlin, we moved into a beautiful apartment, which was formerly uh, belonged to an SS man. And I forgot how my father got hold of that apartment. Where it, was it? Number it was three. in Berlin. Yeah, I do. I do know. It was on uh, Tempelhofstrasse. Berlin is divided into sections, like in Brooklyn. You have this. There, there was Tempelhof, Schlachtensee, various different sections. We lived in Tempelhof. It was called Tempelhof because it was uh, it was right next to the airport. And the uh, the main uh, the airport of, of Berlin was in Tempelhof. It was within walking distance of where we lived. Beautiful apartment. Did you ever live in a DP camp? Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'll come to it, yeah. We, I did live in the DP camp, in Berlin, later on. Oh, yeah, wait, why, why do I, I skipped? Oh, when we came to Berlin, oh, I'm sorry. First we came to a DP camp, of course, yeah, yeah. I, I made the, I switched the order. We lived, uh, in Berlin there were two main DP camps. One was in Tempelhof, and one was in Schlachtensee. So in the camps, right away there was a cheder, and there was a Hebrew school, and there was... A, all kinds of Jewish activities and the Zionists were very strong there. So as a matter of fact, in Berlin, in, that, in the DP camp in Tempelhof, I learned in the morning I went to a, what was called the Hebrew school, where we, we were taught Hebrew. The main purpose was to teach us Zionism. I picked up, I, I speak a good Hebrew yet, until today from that period. They forced us to speak only Hebrew, and that was the first time that I, we were, one, of they, one day they asked us to write what we remember from the war. And I wrote this up, I don't know what happened to it, they printed it someplace, uh, and we had to write it in any language we wanted. And uh, just a second, and uh, anyway, in that camp I learned an awful lot, and then after I learned Nechida. And, uh, and we learned that I began learning Chumish, Rashi, and uh, and it was it was a full Jewish life in, 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 in the DP camps. There was davening, I remember already the Shabbos, the Kiddush. I remember sukkahs, making a sukkah, and uh, everything. Uh, and in the in, in the DP camps, there, were, there was a, an American chaplain came to visit us. Do you uh, remember the name? No, I forgot. Oh yeah, wait, I should know the name. Wait, 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 wait. I, sh I met him eventually in New York. He was, a former, he was a rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, a chaplain. I think I, I, maybe his name will come back to me later on. I don't remember right now. And he brought sidurim, and he brought, he brought religious articles for us, and other things. Uh, uh, I do remember right, uh, when we were already in Lodge, the, we got matzahs from America, machine matzahs. This was, to us, was a chiddush. We didn't know about machine matzahs. We only knew hand matzahs. But uh, we were told that we could use it. When did you first understand what had happened to the rest of the Jews in Europe? I began understanding it, Mustama, towards the end of the, in the beginning, uh, right after we were liberated, sometimes before. I didn't know about the world Jewry, uh, but I knew that many Eden were killed by the Germans. That I knew. I don't know uh, if I was told or I understood, uh, but I knew. What were the family plans once you had gotten to Berlin? Did you think Well, you my fa I didn't know. I didn't have any plans. I just did what my parents told me to do. Uh, but uh, I was being educated, basically. I had a lot of fun there in the DP camps. We used to run around into the woods, and we used to go on hikes, and uh, we had no, we had no, nothing to worry. We, everything was provided for us. But my father did business. Zinovar Tzedek. 